Good morning. I have in my hands here a little clay pot that I picked up when I was in India a number of years ago. And uh, when if you travel by train in India, one of the things that you used to delight early in the morning was hear that voice crying, Jaya, Jaya, hot sweet tea. And sometimes in some areas of India, you drink it out of a clay pot. This is one of those clay pots that you drunk my chai out of. It, what was important was inside. You see, at the end, after you drunk it, you'd throw it down on the ground. And, and this is particularly weak and fragile, this clay pot. But it was the treasure that was inside, that tea, first thing in the morning. We've been looking at the great commandment this week. And Martin encouraged us as we started off loving God. And that reason, says Martin, for existence. Why are we here? Life has significance in this at least, that we learn to love God. John Piper says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. This supreme above anything relationship, as we seek to please God, as scripture says, we make it our goal to please him. This Father God, the first greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and strength. We do it because not because we have to and we've been created by him have been made by him in our mother's womb and we've been rescued by him we've been new creations in him but we come to love him and that's the greatest commandment i think augustine is said to have said the words uh, love god and do whatever you please for the soul trained in love to god will do nothing to offend the one who is beloved whether you said it or not the greatest commandment is to love God. Secondly, Tim encouraged us to think about loving our neighbour as ourselves. Those are the words of Jesus. And Jesus, says Tim, gave us the best example as he looked at a man who was lame and, and uh, he, he looked first and then he stopped for them and then he listened with his eyes. That's so important. I found that so practical on Tuesday. And then he spoke as the Holy Spirit prompts us. That's how we speak. But you know, the greatest commandment has to be the context for the Great Commission and that's where we're going for the next three days. Jesus for example says if you love me you obey my command. So here's the context of the Great Commission. This is what it says in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus came to him and said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you to the end of the age. That commandment that is there. We're going to hear of that about from Beverly tomorrow to make disciples. But I want us to recognize who he's speaking to. Here's the context of those words. When they saw him, they went on the mountain, they, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them. So those there's some worship him and there's some doubting. And yet Jesus speaks his commands to the same group, those who are worshipping, those who are doubting. That's Christian life, isn't it? Moments. I don't know where you are. Are you worshipping this morning? Or are you questioning and doubting? And Jesus says all authority in heaven and earth, all exousia is the word power, authority, privilege. The message paraphrase puts this like this. God authorised and commanded me to commission you. God is authorised. God's authority. Do you remember Jesus spoke to another lame man? Uh, you remember the story when the lame man was let down through the roof and, and Jesus says your sins are forgiven. And there's a question about authority to show you. He says I have authority to forgive sin. Take up your bed and walk. Jesus had the authority to forgive sin, authority to drive out demons and spirits, evil spirits. He, he not just had ability and was able, but he had the right and the permission. Can I put it like that? You remember the story of Narnia, lying the witch in the wardrobe, and the white witch who had subdued Narnia into this winter, always winter, never Christmas. But they were waiting, there was beavers and those other animals, for the rightful king, King Aslan. See, the white witch is the usurper. Satan's kingdom comes about, says C.S. Lewis through those books, through the rebellion of humankind. That rebellion against the true king, the true ruler, and sin enters our world, Genesis chapter 3, through Adam and Eve in that garden. And Satan's pseudo kingdom, if you like, is built. And he's been constantly striking and tripping up and seeking to rule in our lives ever since. Ah, says, but says God to the serpent. The seed of the woman will crush your head. That's Christ. He's speaking of Jesus. Only one has ever truly been the seed of woman. And through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, everything changes. 
Jesus talks at one point about needing to bind the strong man so you may plunder his dungeons. Jesus has won the right, the privilege of universal authority. Oh, by, not, by the way, not just for one nation, Israel, but for every tribe, nation and people. We'll come back to that. But fast forward to Revelation because there's going to be some from every tribe, nation, language and people and tongue. Listen to the words uh, in, one, in, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 21. This is what it's about. And it says this. He says, he says that power is like, as a mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God has placed all things under his feet the head of everything for the church. He, Jesus, is able and has the right to plunder hell and free the captives because of the work of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, his resurrection. George Lath, who wrote a great uh, mode on the kingdom of God in a book called The Perspectives on the Christian Movement, pretty hefty tome, he says this, this is the good news of the kingdom. Christ has wrested authority from Satan. The kingdom of God has attacked the kingdom of Satan. This evil age has been assaulted by the age to come in the person of Christ. All authority, power and privilege is now his. He will not display this authority in his final to in his final glorious victory until he comes again. But the authority or the right is now his. Satan is defeated and bound. Death is conquered. Sin is broken. All authority is his. And Jesus reminds in our verses, he reminds the worshippers and the doubters of that. That's all of us at any point in our Christian lives. Let me take you back to my clay pot. What was this all about? Well, about 25 years later, Paul is writing to a church that's pretty messed up, worshippers and doubters. And he reminds them of six pictures, a perfume of love letters and ambassadors. And they all say the same thing. They're saying this, God wants to use you. And he says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, these amazing words, he says these words, he says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. What ministry? What ministry, Paul? Tell him the good news. You see, it's like treasure, he says. It's like the treasure. It's the glory of God, the character and all he is. It's the glory of God in the face of Christ. You know, the one who's got all authority. And we have this treasure in jars of clay. All authority, right, privilege and power are his. He has won it. He is the rightful owner. And somehow, by grace, he chooses to use us, even the doubters as well as the worshippers. Paul says, perplexed, hard-pressed, does that fit you? Persecuted, struck down, doubting. Ah, listen to these words. We have this treasure, the, the glory, the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that all surpassing power is from God and not from us. Therefore, we do not lose heart. He ends that passage in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, do we do not lose heart, though outwardly are wasting away. Two bookends, if you like. We do not lose heart. We've got this ministry and the authority of Jesus Christ. We do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day because we fix our eyes on what is unseen. We don't lose heart. Love God. Love our neighbour shine like stars in this universe as we hold out the word of life as Paul writes to the Christians in Philippi. Hold out the word of life and why do we do it? We do it on the authority of Jesus Christ, King Jesus. Father God this morning thank you for the wonder that you choose to use such as us but all authority and right and privilege belong to you Lord Jesus, King Jesus. And we go and we walk into this day as your ambassadors. What a privilege to be not only your children, but also your ambassadors, as we hold out the word of life in Jesus' name. Amen. God go with you. And tomorrow 
We'll come back with Beverly and we'll look a little bit further at this great commission, this great commandment that comes from the words and from the lips of Jesus. Every blessing.